Good morning and welcome to Casino Baptist Church. My name is Pastor Stephen Gort and I want to thank you for joining with me today, for joining with me on this last Sunday in September. Yes, you might be rejoicing because it's a weekend to be thinking about sport, but also in the, even in the midst of that, can you please be thinking and praying for, which is more important, our year 12s. Over the last couple of days, they have graduated year 12, and now in just a couple of weeks time, they'll have their HSC beginning. So please be in prayer for them as we head into these two weeks of school holidays and then the exam start. Also be praying for your church, be praying for your neighbors, be praying for us and our church that we may be able to serve God, respond to God, and then live the way that God wants. And when we think of our world, there are so many things that we could be praying for. When we think of what's happening, the escalation between Russia and the Ukraine, when we think about with Her Majesty's death, and now what does that mean for England and so forth? with King Charles III. Now, when we think about other situations in the world, China, Taiwan, whatever it might be, we are not in control, but God is. Nothing happens that God doesn't know about. So put your prayers to him because he can do something about it. So today we're going to continue our series looking at Matthew's gospel. We're going to look at Matthew chapter 15, verse 21 through to 28. And if you've got your Bibles, you might like to turn with me there. And as we begin, let me do what I just encourage you to do, which is to pray. Let me pray. Gracious Father, we just thank you for who you are. We thank you for your love for us. We thank you that you are in control of all things. And Lord, even if there is something on our minds today that is causing us stress, Father, help us to hand it over to you, to leave it with you, because you can do something about it. Thank you, God, that you hear our prayers. And as we open your word now, encourage us, challenge us, so that we can walk closer to you. In your name we pray. Amen. Have you got your Bibles? Matthew chapter 15, and I'm going to look at verse 21 through to 28. And as we look at this today, I wonder, has anyone ever called you a dog. You know, it's in conversation, someone's got angry at you, whatever it might be. Has anyone ever called you a dog? And if the answer is yes, how did it make you feel? I just want you to start to think about that. Let me share something with you that maybe you have heard before. It's by a gentleman called Mike Atkinson. And he wrote this. This is the short version, but let's have a look at it. If you can start your day without caffeine, well, I'm out, first hurdle, gone, but let me continue. If you can always be cheerful, ignoring aches and pains, if you can resist complaining and boring people with your troubles, if you can eat the same food every day and be grateful for it, if you can take criticism and blame without resentment, if you can resist treating a rich friend better than a poor friend, if you can face the world without lies and deceit, if you can sleep without the aid of medication, if you can say honestly that deep in your heart you have no prejudice against creed, colour, religion or politics, then my friend he says, you are almost, almost as good as your dog. And maybe you've heard that before. I mean, I like that. And it gets us thinking about ourselves in relation to a dog, to an animal that many may actually think is a dirty animal. And the fact is, in many cultures, to be called a dog is derogatory. It's demeaning. And in our culture, if you called someone a female dog, then whoa, that is derogatory. You might be thinking, why all this about dogs? Why should we be thinking 
about being called a dog or what that might mean. Because for some of you, you might think, you know, be called a dog, it's okay. Yeah, dogs, man's best friend, you love dogs. I mean, I love dogs. And maybe you look at them and think, wow, they have outstanding faith, outstanding trust in their humans. So you wouldn't mind being called a dog. But what about the rest of us? Why are we talking about being called a dog? Why are we thinking about how we may feel, how we may respond? Well, that's because we come to Matthew 15. And as we look at verse 21 to 28, we get a situation where Jesus, now get this, Jesus actually calls a woman a dog. Now, I don't know about you, but when I read through this, I'm starting to think, well, what's going on here? Jesus is doing this? Why would he do this? And that's why I want us to think about it today as well. Because on this journey through Matthew's Gospel and journey of the Messiah, we've slowly seen not just the general people, but the disciples. Remember last week from uh, Matthew chapter 40, the disciples finally got to the very first time in the gospel where they went, hey, light bulb moment, you are the Son of God. They understood just a little bit more in their step of faith who Jesus was and what he came to do. Just a small step, but it was growth. The message, though, from Jesus, all through the gospel, actually all through all the Gospels, is the same. Nothing changes. There are only two ways to live. You're with God or you're not. And if you want to be with God, there is only one way to have faith in him. And that faith is by believing in Jesus. But he has this constant battle. Now Jesus, as I said right back at the beginning of Matthew's Gospel, he is reaching out at this stage predominantly to the Jewish people. Okay, Matthew's gospel, it really is a Jewish gospel. And he's been sharing mainly with the Jews. They, from the Old Testament, are God's people. They should understand how to worship God. They should know about God. They have been waiting for the Messiah. And Jesus has come along, put up his hand and said, Hey, that's me. I'm the Messiah. But they still don't get it. And more than that, as we go into Matthew's gospel, it becomes harder and harder for Jesus to share his message. It becomes more of a battle. You would think that they would welcome him with open arms, but they don't. And more and more people start to think, how can we kill Jesus? Because they don't like what he's saying. Why then? Why are the Jewish people finding it so difficult? Well, the message that Jesus brings, trust God or have faith in him, is confronting. The gospel message is a confronting message. But again, why? Well, for the Jewish people, their faith is dictated by trusting in what man says. Not so much in trusting God, not in trusting Jesus. Because their faith is determined by what man says. Let me explain. Now, during the time of Jesus, as far as the Jewish people were concerned, there were only two types of people. Jews and non-Jews. Now, they were God's chosen people from the Old Testament. God, out of his grace and mercy, he could have chosen anyone. But he chose the Jewish people to be his people. He gave them the law. He gave them commandments. He told them how to worship him. You are my people, he says. So they've been chosen by God. They were chosen to be the only ones they thought of him to worship God. They thought, as the Jewish people, they are the only ones who could have faith in God. And they built their worship around three foundations. Three foundations that God, in his wisdom, gave them in the Old Testament. Now, these were good foundations. Don't ever get that wrong. These were good foundations when God gave them to them. The first 
was that the men were to be circumcised. Second, they were to celebrate various Jewish festivals and Sabbaths. And third, they were to hold to different purity laws. Now, maybe you haven't heard of the purity laws before, but these were separate laws that they had which defined clean and unclean. Certain types of food, like pork, was unclean. And for a Jewish person, they could only eat clean food. They could only touch certain types of objects. Objects like dead bodies or dead animals or people who had leprosy or were really sick, they were unclean and they couldn't be touched. And what the clean and unclean, what the distinction was, was that if you had done something, ate something, touched something that made you unclean, then you could not worship God. You had to be made clean again by the high priest before you could worship God. So the purity laws were very big for them. And God had given them to, and all these foundations were good foundations so that God's people from the Old Testament, when he chose them to be his people, would stand out from the other nations. They would look different and show that they worshipped the one true God. Because what those foundations all do is point that we belong to one God. And when we live these out, we show that we live to the one God and for the one God. That is what they were supposed to do. That was how it was originally set up. And notice that when you look at these foundations, they are all something that you do. They are all external things that could be looked at. So someone else, like a religious leader, could look at you and go, yes, I can see you fulfilling these three foundations. They were obvious to everyone. All good came from God. But the Jewish religious leaders, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes and others, they took those foundations and then took them an extra step. Because, remember I just said they were external, they were something that you could see whether someone was keeping them or not. Well, they then said, right, we will look at everyone and, in a sense, tick the box. And if we see that you are keeping them, we will tell you that you are okay with God. Do you see how God had given them good things, but then it wasn't any more have faith in God. It wasn't any more you worship God God's way. It was that you had to faith in God was having men tell you whether you had faith in God or not. They had changed what God had given them. Now, remember, two types of people, Jews and non-Jews. Now, non-Jews are also known as Gentiles. And this distinction, clean and unclean from their purity laws, they thought that anyone who was a non-Jew, a Gentile, was therefore unclean, that they were contaminated by paganism, that they had other gods or didn't believe in anything or whatever it might be. Because remember, as far as a Jewish person was concerned, Jew, worship God, only you. Everyone else can't worship God. Everyone else is a pagan and therefore unclean. Gentiles were as unclean as a dead body. Unclean as the dead carcass of an animal. And the Jewish people would treat the Gentiles that way. Now, the, remember, to have faith in God was that the religious leaders, as far as the Jewish people were concerned, told you whether you had faith in God, whether you ticked the box, followed all the foundations, which meant that a Gentile could become a worshipper of God if they became a Jew, if they held to those foundations, circumcised, uh, the religious festivals, the Sabbath, the uh, purity laws. You know, if you kept to all them, then you too 
dictated by what man said, could worship God. That was the way it was in Jesus' day. As far as having faith in God, and if God was removed from the picture, it was all about what man said. And we see this earlier in chapter 15, if you read earlier, because they're arguing about, oh, you have faith in God. Why? Because you're eating the right food. Again, it goes back to those purity laws. So if you want to know if you worship God, imagine today that you were back living in the time of Jesus. You would have to go to the religious leader and have him tell you that you are okay with God, that you were actually living a life that you had faith in God. You had to trust man and not God. Now, that's the culture. That's where the Jewish religion had got to. Now, into this comes Jesus. Now, Jesus was born into a Jewish family. He was a descendant of King David. He was from the tribe of Judah, a descendant of Abraham, the father of Jewish people. He was baptized, he was circumcised, sorry, as a baby. And he grew up observing all these Jewish foundations. But when he began his ministry, and we've seen this in Matthew's gospel, his message was different. His message wasn't to have faith in God, go to the religious leaders and they'll tell you whether you're okay or not. No, it wasn't hold to these foundations and then if the Jewish leader says so, you will be okay. No, his message changed to be if you want to have faith in God, then you have to have faith in Jesus. You have to trust him. And you can see that in our reading. I mean, verse 21 says, leaving that place, Jesus withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon. Now, he'd been around the area of the Sea of Galilee, and we've looked at that over the last couple of weeks, and he now comes to the city of Tyre. Now, Tyre was an ancient non-Jewish city. It's a Gentile city. In other words, when you think about what we've been talking about with the culture, this city is an unclean city filled with unclean people. And more than that, it was a town that actually the people in it were very anti-Jewish, very anti-Israel, and had been their bitter enemies for a long time. Now, one of uh, the great historians of the day was a guy called Josephus, and he, he made this comment that the t people in Tyre were Israel's most bitter enemies. An unclean city filled with unclean people who were the bitter enemies of Israel. And this is the people that Jesus goes and visits. I mean, now, why does he go here? Now, we don't really have the answer. If you read this similar uh, event in Mark's gospel, it gives the idea that Jesus just wanted to get away from the crowds that he had around the Sea of Galilee. And that might be it. Maybe it's because the people around the Sea of Galilee were getting cranky with him. They were calling in the Romans because they felt that his teaching was uh, treasonous and other things. And so maybe he just wanted to get away from that and take a break. Or maybe he went to this city deliberately because in this city he was in the story we're going to look at today he was going to meet someone and their life was going to be changed but when we read through these verses what we realize that there's a lot of strange and unusual things going on well first of all when he gets to the town he meets this woman she comes to him with a request now this is some the first time that somebody's come to Jesus with a request, but it is unusual. I mean, she's a woman, and in Jesus' day, in his culture, particularly with Jewish men, uh, they wouldn't speak to a woman, uh, even their wife or their mother, and rarely ever in public. But this isn't a Jewish woman approaching Jesus. Remember, it's an unclean city filled with unclean people. She's a non Jewish woman. She's a Greek woman born in Syrian Phoenicia. She is unclean. 
So this is unusual. A woman approaches a Jewish man. An unclean woman approaches what the Jewish people would call a clean man. Yet, despite of this, she comes to Jesus and she begs that he would deliver her daughter from her demonic spirit. Now, the other thing to realise in that, in that culture is, you know, for the Jewish people, two types of people, Jews and non-Jews, they believe that non-Jews were all inhabited by demons. So this woman coming to Jesus and saying, hey, my daughter has a demon, can you cast her out? They would think, yeah, yeah, that's normal. You're unclean. Of course, your daughter has a demon. But what's also unusual, not just that she's a woman, not just that she's unclean, not just that you know, she's a Gentile and she comes to Jesus. All that's highly unusual. But more than that, Jesus' response is unusual. Now, we're used to Jesus giving compassion. We're used to Jesus helping people. And he normally does it quickly. But look what happens. I mean, verse 23, Jesus did not answer a word. No immediate response, no even acknowledgement of her, no help. And then the good Jewish disciples decide they're going to put the boot in. They tell her to go away. And then in verse 24, Jesus adds, He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. Remember, up until this point, Jesus has been saying all along that he even cried tears when he looked at Israel and described them as being shepherdless, he said that he needed to first come to Israel. And so he says it again here, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. Now the woman, you would think, this was all situation, totally uncharacteristic, totally abnormal, unusual, that at this stage, having it Jesus and the disciples all saying, go away, she doesn't. And then Jesus gives what would almost be classified as clangor as far as I'm concerned. He replied, verse 26, it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Now, in this parable, it's very clear that the children refer to the people of Israel. And the bread refers to Jesus' ministry and his sharing and talking and all his teaching, his miracles and everything else. And the dogs in this parable refer to the non-Jews, to the Gentiles, to this woman. <coughs> Excuse me. Remember, a Gentile city, an unclean city, unclean people. A Jew would have very rarely even come here. And he's talking to this unclean woman. She comes to him and says, Jesus, I need help. I need you to cast this demon out for my daughter. And Jesus' response is silence, tells her to go away, and then calls her a dog. He tells her that he should finish his ministry to Israel before he branches out to help anyone else, to the non-Jews. Now, this is unusual. Now, when you call someone a dog, when we think today, and this is one of the reasons why I got you to think about it earlier, we often have beautiful, fluffy, clean dogs. Uh, but that was not the case in Jesus' day. And so this really is a derogatory term. Now, for normal Jewish people to call a non-Jew a dog, not so much of an issue. But Jesus does it here. What's going on? What is Jesus saying? Because what he's saying is true. He has come first, and he said this all the way through Matthew's gospel, to bring his word, the truth of the gospel message, to the Jews first, that they needed to have faith in God, but they weren't responding. But he had to finish going to them before he could look to share it with someone else. His statement is true. But it hasn't finished there. The unusualness has not finished. Because look at verse 27. Yes, it is, Lord. She agrees with him. She understands exactly what he's saying. Even the dogs, she's talking about herself here, remember. 
eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. This humble, unclean, Gentile woman faced not just with Jesus, but the disciples all around her, keeps standing there and understands. This woman humbly gets it. She realises that having faith in God doesn't depend on being a Jew. She understands that having faith in God doesn't require Jewish religious leaders to say, hey, you've ticked the box, you're okay with God. She understands that having faith in God doesn't require you to hold to those foundational principles that the Jewish held to, the purity laws, the circumcision, the Sabbath, and so forth. She understands that. She un but her, what she understands is that to have faith in God means she trusts Jesus. She trusts that Jesus could cast out this demon if he decided to. She believes he can do it. All it depends is trusting in him. I mean, this is a beautiful picture that this woman gets, it, that she understands who he is, that he is the Messiah, that he can do this miracle, that he can have compassion on her and her child. And she comes to him begging, Jesus, I understand you need to go to your people first. I understand, but please, Jesus, can you come to me too? I know that you could heal my daughter. Cast out that demon, Jesus. I trust you. I know. Please, Jesus, cross the boundaries. Not just to the Jews, but come to the dogs. Come to the unclean. Please, Jesus, I trust you. Now, the picture here that the dogs sit under the table, licking up the crumbs. Yes, as Jesus gives out the word to the children. Bits drop through other people, the Gentiles, the dogs, hear his teaching, the children still get fed if they accept it, but so do the dogs. The meal's not even interrupted. She knows Jesus has come to the Jews, but she also knows that he's come to the Gentiles. She's, he's come to the dogs. Jesus sees her faith and acts. Verse 28, then Jesus said to her, woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. And her daughter was healed at that moment. This is only the second time in Matthew's gospel where Jesus has looked at someone and said, you had great faith. Now, last week we uh, had the disciples walking on water and remember what Jesus said to Peter? Not for the first time. Oh, you of little faith. But here, for the second time in Matthew's gospel, he says, you have great faith. The other time was back in Matthew 8 with the centurion. Now, do you notice something? The centurion and this Syrian Phoenician woman, they were both Gentiles. They were both unclean. They both had outstanding faith in Jesus because they trusted in him, not religion. They trusted in him, not being a Jew. They trusted in him and not having a Jewish religious leader tick the box and say, yes, you've kept the foundations. You are okay for God. None of that. They had outstanding faith because they trusted Jesus. Now, chapter 15, he reminds us that for the Jewish people of the day, they weren't worshipping God correctly. It didn't matter about following set rules. What mattered was putting your faith and trust in the right person. It was about putting it in Jesus. Why? Because God is more concerned with where our heart is at than anything else. Clean or unclean food does not matter. Being a clean or unclean person does not matter. What matters 
is where your heart is with God. Who are you trusting? Now, right back at the beginning, I started you to think about being called a dog and how might you respond to that. And the reason I want you to do that is that we are the dogs in this story. Now, if you're a Jewish person, that is different. But for most of us, if not all of us, we are non-Jews. We are Gentiles. We are the dog in this story. We are unclean. Now, even today, Jewish people would call us unclean. Now, Jesus dealing with this woman, same as with the centurion, gives the foretaste of what is going to happen later on. He looks at these people who've responded to him, non-Jews, Gentiles, unclean, and he says, you've got great faith. And he blesses them. He heals and so forth, cast out the demons. That is the foretaste of the blessings for us today. Because we are the Gentiles, the unclean, that if we put our faith and trust in Jesus in the same way, then we too will be blessed. Yes, at the moment, Jesus is his ministry here in Matthew's gospel, he is aiming it at the Jewish people. But later on, he's going to spread it to the Gentiles and the rest of the world. This response between the woman and Jesus is totally unusual. It's abnormal the way it all pans out. But the way things Jesus, the way things happen in Jesus' ministry, a lot of it is unusual. A lot of it is confronting. And it's going to lead him in the end to the cross where he dies and is resurrected. That is an unusual occurrence. We'd all have to agree with that. But it just opens the message of the gospel to the world. That anyone who puts their faith and trust in Jesus, that's all it takes. Religions, you don't have to follow them. Man-made rules, you don't follow those. You just have to trust in Jesus. But this doesn't really match our world, does it? Not what our world would say is normal. We live in a society that says you really get only what you earn. And in a way, all other religions are based on that. You've got to do something. Remember the Jewish foundational things? They were all something external. They were all something that people could see, whether you're doing them or not. And Jesus says, no, my message changes that. It's not about what you do as a person. It's about what I've already done. That's why I want you to put your faith and trust in me. So today, I wonder whether we have the same trust in Jesus as that woman did back then. Do we trust that he can forgive us for our sins? Or do we think we have to earn it? Are we trying to you know, be at church every time the door opens or... Uh, financially give enough money or whatever it might be to earn God's love, to earn God's forgiveness? Are we trying in our own way to tick the box to have man say, yes, you're now okay with God? Are we trying to do that or do we have outstanding faith, which is what I've called today's message, because that's what that woman had, outstanding faith. Do we have that same outstanding faith? that we trust in what Jesus has already done. And then we show it by how we live. God takes our, God looks at our heart. I wonder where your heart is at today. I wonder where my heart is at. Do we have faith in him? Do we trust him? Now, even going to church or saying, yes, we're believers. I think we also need to see the challenge here that it is all about Jesus in chapter 15 of Matthew's gospel. It's all about having faith in him, nothing else. And sometimes, though, maybe at church, I think, we can set up for new people and who are coming and seeking answers to find out more about Jesus. I think sometimes we could set up man-made hurdles, a bit like the Jewish religious leaders have. And we can say, 
things that you've got to be a certain age or dress a certain way or watch or read certain things, attend certain churches, worship in certain ways. And then if people do that, we then say, yes, you're now ready to be okay with God. Do we do it? Now, I think there's a little challenge here that we can be like the Jewish people, that the Jewish religious saying what is clear, clean and what is unclean, we can do something similar. Now, our world often makes distinctions, rightly or wrongly, by race or creed or intelligence or power or money. But Jesus changes them. Jesus just says anyone who comes to him in faith can worship God. Are we as tolerant? Are we as welcoming and loving to those who are different to us? And we don't need a church where everyone looks like Stephen. That would be dull and boring and wrong. <laughs> but do we do it? Do we set up those man-made rules that make people look like us because we feel comfortable with that? instead of loving and welcoming just because people put faith in Jesus. That's how you know, the Jewish people would not have understood. His disciples, why are we going to Tyre? They're unclean. It's a city of unclean people. They're our enemies, Jesus. Surely you know your history. Why would we go there? Maybe we say the same to the people in our community. Oh, we don't want you here. Why are you coming here? Or maybe. Now, Jesus went out to Tyre. He went to her. Do we do that? Are we willing to step outside our comfortable church building and go share Jesus with someone else? It's all about him. It's all about faith in him. This woman showed outstanding faith. She trusted in Jesus no matter what. Will we? Will we have outstanding faith that sticks to following Jesus? Even when life gets tricky? Even when people speak up against us? Will we keep our outstanding faith. Now, the Jews thought there were only two types of people in the world, Jews and non-Jews. Well, in a way, you're right, there are. But that distinction doesn't matter. There are only two types of people in the world, those who believe in Jesus and those who don't. One has a faith that's outstanding and will last for eternity, one is dead. Which one is it for us today? Which one do we show as we live out? Do we have the outstanding faith of this woman? Because our faith is solely in Jesus. Or is it somewhere else today? Let me pray. Father, we thank you for the challenge given here. Lord, these verses sit uncomfortable with us, I think. Uncomfortable because it's so easy for us to be just like the Jews. But all Jesus wanted, and he saw it in this woman, the simpleness of faith in him. Father, let us, who may have already said we love and follow you, not lose that, not take it for granted. But realise it is our only core foundation. And then live out our love and response and thankfulness to that by sharing that same message that we've responded to, to others. Lord, help us to have outstanding faith today and this week in your name. Amen. Well, I want to thank you for joining with me today. I love looking at Matthew's Gospel and my prayer is that you do too. Please keep praying for our world. We need Jesus to return. 
we need God's peace to break in. But before that happens, and we don't know when that's going to be, we would love God through his spirit to bring more people to follow him. May that be your prayer as God blesses you and your family this week. See you next week.